God tonight. I just want us to, to look at Luke chapter 20. And we're going to read from verse 34 to 36. This is what the word of God says. Jesus replied, the people of his age, marrying and given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, for they will no longer die, for they are like angels. They are God's children, and since they are children of the resurrection, and God will bless his word to us this evening. You know, what I want to talk to you tonight uh, about is really what angels are like. I think this week on, on Tuesday I really covered about the interactions of angels with mankind. But tonight we're going to look at just a different aspect of the angelic beings. One of the amazing statements that Jesus actually made was when he spoke to the Sadducees. And they came to Jesus with a question about on the resurrection. And he asked Jesus about a, a woman. He said this woman had seven husbands in succession and all of them had died. And he wanted to know whose wife would she be in the resurrection since she was married to all of them. Now Jesus not only pointed out the error in their belief, he was to read Mark's Gospel, he points out the error that they were believing incorrectly. But he also revealed an amazing truth. He said those worthy of taking part in the resurrection. The only way a person can be worthy of taking part in the resurrection if they're born again in the Spirit of God and live totally committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus said those worthy of taking part in the resurrection will neither marry or be given in marriage. Neither will they die, they will be like the angels. So Jesus clearly was endorsing the reality of angels. In fact, he said after the resurrection, and that's speaking about our resurrection and not his, we will be like angels. Therefore, it's important to understand what angelic beings are truly like. Now, angels are of a different order than mankind. They totally a different species, so to speak. And they, they differ in their time, they differ in their position, they differ in their rank or their operation, the operation being the tasks that they carry out. And the Bible names, you know, one type of angelic beings as cherubim. And these angelic beings are of the very top order of God's angelic order. And they're tremendous, powerful angels, and they're tremendously beautiful. The first time we see them mentioned is in Genesis chapter 3. And they were the ones that guarded the way to the tree of life. And the reason for this was because Adam and Eve had now sinned. Their nature had completely changed. They now had a fallen sin nature. And so Adam and Eve, in a sinful state, if they had eaten from the tree of life, then forever they would have lived in a fallen condition with no hope for salvation. So for the cherubim to actually guard the way to the tree of life was really showing tremendous mercy from the living God. So cherubims are clearly associated with the mercy of God. See, when Moses was even commanded by God or instructed by the Lord to make the Ark of the Covenant, the Bible actually says two cherubim facing each other were to be placed upon the side of the mercy seat, the covering over the Ark of the Covenant. And God said in Genesis chapter 25 and verse 22, he said that above the cover between the two cherubims that are above the Ark of the Testament, I will meet with you and give all the commandments for Israel. So the cherubims are not only associated with the mercy of God, but they guard the very presence of God. And the fact that they had two, two cherubim modelled and made from gold upon the Ark of the Covenant served as a reminder to the high priest it served as a reminder that he couldn't approach the presence of God in a sinful condition. It would have reminded them of what happened in the garden. But praise the Lord, we can approach the, the Lord now simply because of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've received mercy from him and it's because of his mercy we can approach the presence of God. Now another order of angelic beings that the Bible mentions are seraphim. And the word seraphim actually means burning ones. And could it be 
really that they called burning ones because of their burning devotion towards the living God. I believe that these angels are used of God to set hearts on fire, not just for God, but to live a holy life for God, because God wants his people to walk in holiness. So the cherubims are associated with that. When the prophet Isaiah had a throne room encounter in Isaiah chapter 6, he clearly saw seraphim. And the Bible tells us they were flying and carrying out or crying out to each other. They were crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of the voices, Isaiah said that the door post shook and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. There's a power that resonates from the voice of the angel and authority that comes from the presence of God. And that smoke really to me speaks of the glory cloud of God's presence. No artificial smoke that some people put on stages today in many, many churches, but this was the genuine glory of God. Now the prophet's first reaction was to recognize his sinful nature in the presence of a holy God. You see, the closer you get to the Lord, the more you realize that you're not as good as you, you, you ought to be. I was explaining to some people a number of weeks ago that, you know, when I was a teenager, before I knew the Lord Jesus Christ, and you went to a disco, they used to have lights on this big ball shining around the dance floor. And if you ever went close to it, you found that if you had any dandruff or any fluff on your coat or anything, it would start to show up. The more you came into the light, things started to show up. And so Isaiah has experienced this, even though he's a prophet of God, even though he's brought tremendous prophecies previously, he's now realizing in the presence of a holy God, really how sinful he is. And so the seraphims took a live coal. In other words, a hot coal. The Bible says they took it with tongues from the fire, but yet carried it in their hands. So the seraphim carried the fire of God. And they carried this hot coal and they touched his lips, they touched his mouth, and there was a cleaning, there was a purging of that mouth. Every defilement that he had was removed from him so that he could walk in holiness before the living God. How many people today could do with the hot coal of God purging them? Really, it's a, even though it touched his mouth, there was a cleansing of the heart because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. <laughs> So we need to experience that fire of God to cause us to recognize a holy God and have a fear of God that we walk a holy life before him. So seraphims declare the, the holiness of God. They called out holy, holy, holy. I like to think they called it out three times because there is Father, there is Son and his Holy Spirit. So they're recognizing the Trinity but they to do with the holiness of God. They declare the holiness of God and they make people aware of their need to be holy before God right now. But God uses these seraphims to set our hearts on fire for him and for holy service. In other words, that our work is acceptable before him. There are many believers today that do works, but their works are not really acceptable because they've not come from the living God or even if they are they're not doing it for him they're doing it for themselves Isaiah's ministry changed as a result of an encounter with these particular group of angels this angelic order called seraphims now when you read through the word of God there are many orders of angelic beings in the book of Revelations, chapter 4, verse 8, it speaks of living creatures. And part of these living creatures' duty was to worship God. So the aid and the help worship, angels gravitate towards genuine worship that flows from their heart. And it doesn't matter if you're in a church building, it doesn't matter if you're out on the street or in your home, if you genuinely worship the Lord from the heart, they will gravitate towards you. A presence would come. And we need to be people that through our worship, and our worship is directed to God, never to angels, but we need to create an atmosphere that's inducive for God to move and for even angelic visitations so that they move 
amongst us. We're to be people that worship God. And let me just say this, when John, in the book of Revelations, fell down to worship an angel, the angel said, get up on your feet, don't do that. So a genuine angel will not accept worship for itself, but only for the living God. Any counterfeit being an angel of light, where the enemy counterfeits as an angel of light, will accept worship. And that should be a, a clue to you that it's not genuine of the living God. So these living creatures that the Bible mentions are to do with the worship of God. And angels delight in worshiping God. When the saints praise the Lord, the angels join in. We just need to have ears to hear even those voices that aid and help us to worship him. Now, there are other groups of angels in the Bible. The Bible mentions chiefs or archangels. In fact, the word arch actually means chief. So in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13, Michael is referred to as one of the chief princes or an arch prince. He's described as being a prince over the nation of Israel, or should I say God's people. And that's in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. And many people today will talk about how Michael is assigned over the nation of Israel, God's people. But doesn't the Bible tell us that we've been engrafted? Doesn't the Bible tell us in the book of Galatians that we are Abraham's seed? So the way I read this is that Michael is over God's people. Therefore he's over you. And he's well and truly able to protect, to lead and to guide the people into truth. When you read through the word of God, God used an angelic being to guide the children of Israel. God even said to Moses that you need to pay attention to what the angel says and to be obedient to the angel because I put my name within that angelic being. And so the angel directed them, the angel protected them. You know, it was a fire by night and a cloud by day. It went from the front of the camp to the back of the camp when the army of Egypt came against them. So protection came from that angel. And angels today, that's part of their function, will protect as well. But really when the Bible speaks about Michael, it's only showing part of his function. We don't have all, if you like, the revelations on what they do. But as we encounter them, as we encounter our God, who is greater than any angel, God starts to bring us revelations, these revelations into our life. You see, God assigns angels over nations. Every nation has an angel assigned to it. We sometimes just think of principalities and powers and rulers and authority, spirits of wickedness in the heavenly places. And we think that Satan assigns angels or fallen angels to the nation. But really he learned how to do that when he was in the kingdom of God. So God assigns angels over nations. He assigns angels over communities, over cities, over regions, geographic areas. He signs angels over the church. Each branch of the church has angels assigned. The book of Revelations clearly tells us, and to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? So the angel was over that particular church. So an angel will be assigned to the upper ring Christian fellowship. And the angel will watch and the angel will observe our conduct and our behavior. And the angel will respond to faith-filled words. Angels do not respond to negative words, to criticism, to doubt, and to unbelief. They only respond to faith-filled words because the Bible says they are the mighty ones that do his bidding. So when God speaks, they do his bidding. So when you speak the word of God, they consider it to be your will and will act upon it. So we need to be people that speak faithful words. That's one of the ways of activating uh, the angels to work on your behalf. We need to put them to work. Many times we don't do it because we don't speak faithful words. We need to speak the word of God out. All the way through the word of God, you will find that there was people that were involved with angels. You think about Abraham, the Bible tells us when he wanted to secure a bride for his son, Isaac, 
he says to his servant, the angel of the Lord will go before you and make your journey successful. So he knew the angel of the Lord will go before, because they're the mighty ones that do God's bidding. So everything that takes place, the angels of God are involved in. So where there's healing, the angels of God are involved. They don't bring the healing. God heals you. They just carry out his bidding to heal. That's why the Bible tells us in John's Gospel that an angel from time to time came down to the pool at Bethesda and stirred the waters. The first person into the water was healed. Now it was God who healed them, but God used the angel to administer that. Just like God uses you to bring someone to Christ. You don't save the person, Jesus does, but you were just an instrument in his hand to carry out his bidding. So angels are exactly the same. So they administer the things of God and they delight in doing so. So angels are assigned over the different branches of the church. So they would, they, they would see and observe everything we do and would work on our behalf when we start to speak in faith. They're also assigned over each believer so that every believer at conception is assigned an angelic being that will be with them all their days. So when people talk about guardian angels, that is actually true. A person receives a guardian angel who will watch over them, you know, protect them, etc. That angel stays with you. But as you grow in the Lord and as you minister to the Lord, different angels are assigned to you at different times to help you with that ministry. Because the Bible tells us that angels are ministering spirits who were sent to aid the heirs of salvation. And we are the heirs of salvation. And they help us in our proclamation of the gospel, even though they don't speak it, we do. They still help us. They bring courage into our life. They encourage us in many, many different ways. The Apostle Paul, when he was on a ship that was sailing towards Rome. The Bible tells us when it hits a storm, and this storm was devastating, so they couldn't see the light of the sun or even the stars in the sky. And this ship was on the verge of sinking. And yet the angel of the Lord stood beside the apostle Paul, and Paul addressed the people and said, the angel of the Lord whom I serve, not meaning he serves the angel, meaning he serves the Lord who sent his angel. The angel came along and encouraging Paul and telling him that not one person's <coughs> life would be lost on that ship and that Paul was to testify in Rome. So Paul knew he would not die in that water. Paul knew that when he landed on the island of Malta and a viper attached to his arm and he shook it off into the fire, into the anointing of God, he knew he would not die because the angel of God had brought the word of God to say, you will testify of me in Rome before Caesar. So it was impossible for Paul to die in that situation as long as he held to the word of God. And so the angel brought the word of God that encouraged him. All the way through the word of God, you'll see interactions of angels encouraging people. And they delight to encourage and to do the things of God. They did not encourage the prophet Elijah when he fled from Jezebel. They even cooked him a meal. They provided the bread and the water for the journey ahead. And God wants you to take the bread and the water for the journey that's ahead of you. You're all on a journey and you need the fresh bread, you need that water of the word of God to flow into your life, to strengthen you for your journey ahead. But the angel of God came to encourage. Even Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, that Jesus himself was strengthened by angelic beings. And if Jesus Christ needed to be strengthened by angelic beings, then so do we. Jesus was strengthened by angelic beings simply because Jesus Christ operated as a man, the Son of Man, not as the Son of God, a man empowered by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus relied upon the Holy Spirit and every aid his father would give. And angelic beings are part of that aid that father would give. 
So angels are assigned to help the believer to promote the things of God, to advance the kingdom of God. When you think of fallen angels, demonic structures, they're structured very much the same. So in the demonic kingdom, he will have angels that are fallen angels that are assigned over cities, over towns, regions, countries, over people as an individual. Because you have to understand that if God assigns an angel at your conception, the enemy is going to assign a demonic power at your conception to try to trip you up through life and to stir you away from the things of God. So the enemy assigns angels, fallen angels, over certain areas. You know, we can even read in the Bible of marine spirits like Leviathan. Even Jezebel was a marine spirit because it's from Sidonia, that, that marine type area. So the, angel, uh, the angels who are fallen are assigned as well over waters. But you know in Revelation 16 and verse 5, it says this, Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, So God has assigned an angel over the waters of the earth. And we need to understand that truth. We don't have to be panicking or worried about marine spirits because God has assigned angels over the waters. In fact, Jesus Christ walked on the water, putting every marine spirit under his foot. That was the supremacy that the Lord Jesus Christ had. And when he walked on the water, let me just say this to you, it was a sustained miracle. Because the Sea of Galilee is eight miles across. And if Jesus met the disciples in a bowl in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, he walked for four miles. How long would it take you to walk four miles? It was a sustained miracle. Now, angels, as I said, are the mighty ones who do his bidding. And each angel has a name. And that name reflects the character or the calling or the work that God has placed upon those angels' lives. If you think of Michael, the archangel or the chief angel, the chief prince, Michael actually means who is like God. So Michael was someone that reflected the very image of God. Well, Gabriel means mighty one of God. When Gabriel introduced himself to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, he said, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. Zechariah was terrified. If people encountered angelic beings in all their glory, they would be on the faces, literally, because they reflect the glory of God. They carry uh, like a residue of the presence of God. Everything about them reflects the glory of the living God. So Gabriel was a mighty one. No wonder because he'd just been in the presence of God. They're coming from the presence of God. To stand in the presence of God, you have to be holy and right. That's why often they called in the word of God, holy angels. Peter describes angels. He says in 2 Peter 2 and verse 11, he tells us that angels are stronger and more powerful than human beings. When you read through the word of God, you will find in 2 Kings, there was a time when the Assyrian army came against the people of God. And so Hezekiah, along with Isaiah, petitioned the living God. Hezekiah laid down the insults the king of Assyria had, had declared upon the people of God and on God himself. And the Bible tells us that a word came to the prophet Isaiah who released it to Hezekiah. And he said, this city will not be taken. The siege will not even come against it. They'll build no ramps against it. No arrows will be shot here. He says, I'm going to put a report into the king of Assyria that will cause him to leave that place to the place of his demise. And that's exactly what happened. But before he left, the Bible says that God sent an angel, one angel that killed 185,000 of the Assyrian army. Now let me just say, when he killed the Assyrian army, do you think he just picked the foot soldiers? 
I believe that a lot of those leaders, the commanders would have died. The army was no longer in a position to stand against the people of God. And so the angels of God will fight on your behalf. They are mighty ones, they are warriors. It only took one angel to defeat an army of men. And so angelic beings come from a different realm. They don't have a natural body. The Bible makes that clear. They have a spiritual body, although they can take on a human form. The Bible tells us that we to entertain strangers. He said, because by doing so, some have entertained angels unaware. So the angel turns up looking like a regular man, turns up in his jeans, he turns up in his Timberland boots, he just turns up just looking like an ordinary person. And they interact with human beings. And the person may not recognise they're an angel, but then suddenly they go, suddenly they disappear. Suddenly the help that they needed is met, those angels disappear. You know, I remember reading a, an account by a minister called Maxwell White. And he said that one time after ministry, he was driving back on a really uh, dark road and the weather conditions was really bad. And he said an oncoming vehicle was coming towards him and he skidded off the road and he went down the ditch. And uh, he said they were okay, but he was down the ditch and there was no way he could get that car out. So he just simply prayed. Within a few moments, a pickup truck turned up. Two guys got out, he spoke to them, they never really engaged him. They hitched him up, pulled him out, got him back on the road, everything working well. When he turned around to thank them, him, the, the men in the truck were completely gone, vanished out the way. God sends them to, to intervene in our affairs, to help us, and sometimes we entertain angels, we interact with them and we don't even realize it. That should teach you to have better manners towards people and to treat people with respect to you encounter because you could be an encounter encountering an angel so they have dealings with us we know from the word of god that they can take food they can prepare food but they have um, even though they can take on a physical body physical objects present no obstacle to them they simply can walk through them walk through a wall walk through a door when Jesus rose from the dead he simply walked through a wall and encountered the disciples on that first on resurrection Sunday evening so the, he encountered them angels do exactly the same there is no obstacle with them angels get involved in every affair of a person's life you remember in the word of God where the Bible tells us that Peter was arrested and he was imprisoned and the church were earnestly praying for him. Well, an angelic being came, opened those prison doors. In fact, the Bible tells us that a steel door opened by itself. He woke Peter up, chains fell off Peter. He arose thinking he was just in the dream and walked out of that place and people didn't even recognize him or see him. Angels broke him out of a prison. And in Peter's life, that happened on two occasions where the angel of God delivered him from a prison. So angels are used in deliverance. They will set you free from any chains, any prison that is upon your <coughs> life. So when we're ministering in areas of deliverance, we can call upon and ask the Father to just loose the angelic beings to help in that particular area. Because demonic powers do not do well in the presence of angelic beings. They fear them. So we have to understand these particular truths. Physical objects present no obstacles to the angelic beings. Angels have amazing power. The word of God tells us that. And that power doesn't diminish with use. That power comes from God. That's why it doesn't diminish. Your mobile phone will diminish with use. Your physical body, your energy levels will diminish with use. If you were training, you're doing a lot of work, you start to grow tired. Their bodies do not weary, 
they don't get tired or fatigued. The angel doesn't say, give us a minute, I've just done now. He doesn't say, can I stay here for 10 minutes? They just have a, let me have a nap and I'll be back to you. They don't need to be refreshed in that way. All their power comes from the living God. So they don't weary. Neither are they affected by any form of sickness, disease, or even death. Angels cannot die. So even fallen angels cannot die. That was why God created hell for Satan and his angels. It's an eternal prison. It was created for Satan, the Bible says, and his angels because they're eternal beings. They move at supernatural speed. They don't plod along, don't jog along. They move at supernatural speed. They can be visible, they can be invisible. They can move in different ways. You know, sometimes people say, I've seen angels, I've seen the light and, the, and almost like the, the, the shape of them. Even in this, this building, when I've come in and I recognize them, and as soon as I speak to the Lord, I say, Lord, is there angels over there? And I give them the full attention, there's a movement. So often people start to see them just like light. You see, the veil between the natural realm and the supernatural realm is very, very thin. It's almost like if you have a curtain and the curtain's blowing in the wind, you might get pockets of light shine through, then the curtain moves back. And sometimes it's like that where the spiritual realm is concerned. But there are certain places where the veil is thinner simply because that place is used to worship the living God. And that place, you know, something spiritual has happened in that place. You remember when Jacob placed his head upon the rock and went to sleep and he saw the angels of God, the Bible says, ascending and descending. And when he woke up and said, surely, this is the house of God. Surely this is the stairway to heaven, but I didn't perceive it. He recognized it. That veil there was thin because it was the place where Abraham previously had built an altar to the Lord. So where something has been dedicated to the Lord, where there's high activity of true worship to the living God, that veil is thinner. And so there's often more angelic encounters at that time. And I believe we're going to see more angelic encounters because we are living in the seventh day or the beginning of the seventh day. The seventh day, as I've said recently, is really seven days from Adam. And it's the third day from Jesus Christ. What happened on the morning of the first day? Why angelic beings appeared. When the ladies went to the tomb, there were the angels sat upon the rock. We need to understand that we to expect to see angelic beings more and more as we grow in the Lord and we're aware of these things. Because they are the mighty ones to do his bidding. They are here to aid the heirs of salvation. The Bible says the ministering spirits are like winds. They're like fire. There's many occasions where I've been praying and the presence of God has come and it's been like a wind has blown. Nobody is around, it's like a wind blow and you feel that wind, it's the presence of those angelic beings. I've had people pray for me. They've laid hands on me and prayed and when they stopped praying, I felt another hand come and be placed on the back of my head and pray uh, as if someone's praying for me. There's nobody there, look, there's nobody there. It's angelic beings. They're involved in every affair of our life. So these angelic beings, they're intelligent. They have knowledge, although they long to look in to the salvation, the mystery of salvation. That's why the Bible as well tells us we're to be people that declare the manifold wisdom of God into the heavenly realm. And you know, that uh, causes that power of that declaration causes the enemy to tremble, but I believe it, it encourages the angelic beings when they are the truth of God's word being declared. So angels are intelligent. They possess knowledge. They can bring to you direction from the Lord and they can show, even like they did with Manoah's son 
who was Samson. When that child was to be born, they asked the angelic being, what should be the order for this child's life? And the angel of God revealed God's order, the upbringing of that child. We need that today, that people start to bring the children up in the teaching and the training of the Lord. So angels are intelligent, they have knowledge, they can communicate. They're holy because they stand in the presence of God and they're joyful, they're not miserable. They don't turn up and you say to an angel, what's up with you? <laughs> they don't have, you know, Monday morning blues. They're joyful because they, they delight in the presence of God. They communicate God's will perfectly. When an angel of God speaks to you, you will know exactly what that angel of God is talking about. And they delight in serving the living God. They bring answers to your prayer. The book of Daniel tells us that when Daniel began praying, he received no answer for over three weeks, 21 days. But then an angel appeared to Daniel and said, Daniel, you are highly esteemed. So God values people. And the angel of God said, from the moment you began to pray, God heard and the answer was released. But it was delayed in the heavenly realms. It was delayed by who? The Bible says the Prince of Persia, a chief angel that Satan had assigned over that area, a fallen angel, to interfere and to delay the answer to prayer. God released the answer, it was just delayed. So whenever there's delay in your life, it doesn't mean that God is saying no, like some people speak. It just simply means that there could be an embargo, a roadblock to your answer pr to prayer. So angels will bring answers to prayer. The warriors, and they will fight on your behalf because God has commissioned them to serve the heirs of salvation. There's enough angels to go around. They're innumerable. So for every person that's ever lived upon planet Earth, there's been more than enough angel for every person. There is so many of those angelic beings. And the amazing thing is, Jesus said that at the resurrection we will be like them. So when you go on to glory, and let me just say, when you go on to glory, the angels that have escorted you through your life will escort you into that heavenly realm, into the presence of God. Jesus told a story of the rich man and Lazarus. And the Bible tells us that Lazarus died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, meaning the paradise of God. Well, Paul talks about the paradise of God. I know a man who 14 years ago was taken up to the paradise of God. So for the paradise of God has been moved. So the Bible is telling us that they, the angels escort you to that particular place. So you won't be traveling on your own. So when you go on to glory, the Bible says this, the perishable will be clothed with the imperishable. That's like an angelic being. It tells us the natural will become spiritual and will be like them in many, many ways. When the Bible says that in heaven, you will neither marry nor be married, there's a marriage of the Lamb. Is a marriage taking place in heaven but you will not be married in the natural to a particular person because there's no need to reproduce absolutely no need because we're in the presence of the living God you know the Bible is describing what these angelic beings are like so we're not to underestimate them we're to watch our words because angels watch and observe and listen in to what we say. They report to the Lord. Not that God doesn't know what's going on, he does. He just tasks them to report things that take place. And so we're to be very, very respectful, you know, when we speak to people and when we encounter people because those <coughs> angelic things are there. One of the ways that you, you cause those angelic beings to work for you. It's not just to live a Christ-like life, but to speak Christ-like words. 
where we start to speak out the word of God, where we speak faith-filled words and we loose those angelic beings to help us in everything we do. When I've talked about the order of angels, the Bible says this in Hebrews 1 verse 14, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? It doesn't say a certain class serve you, it says are not all angels. When it says are sent to, to, to serve those who will inherit salvation, it doesn't mean that they're going to get a cup of tea for you, or running around with a hoover for you, although they're quite capable of doing those things, they are providing meals and they'll certainly clean your life up, they'll clean your spiritual house up. It's talking about when you are serving the purposes of God, because they abide by the word of God. And so when you are serving the purposes of God, they will seek to serve, to help you accomplish that which God has commissioned you to do. And so in our words, release them to move on your behalf. So when we speak faith-filled words, when we believe in God for a provision or a certain blessing that we need coming in, the angels are carrying that, they're bringing it towards you. But the moment you start to speak doubt and unbelief, it's almost like it stops their progress. Just like a delivery man, he's bringing your parcel, up, you know, Amazon are delivering your parcel, they're bringing it down your path, and you suddenly start to speak negative words. It's like him taking it back to his van. We've got to be people that maintain our confession and stand upon the promise of God because they respond to the word of God. So let's be people that are aware of angelic beings and there's nothing wrong with you asking the Lord, Father, that I may encounter angelic beings, that I may be aware of the presence. And one thing we should be doing by, by speaking in faith is saying, Father, I thank you that my eyes are open to see to the spiritual realm. Not I'm going to see to the spiritual realm one day. Oh Lord, will you open my eyes to see? And you continue to pray, will you open my eyes to see? But we start to pray that initially and then start to thank him. Father, I thank you that my eyes can see. And if you continue to speak that way, you will start to see things that will grab your attention. And God wants our attention to be grabbed so that we might live the life that he wants us to live. Well, let's just pray now. If you do need prayer tonight, if there's any need within your life, our God is able to meet your need. He's a miracle working God. He will heal you. He will restore you. He will provide for you. He will encourage you. He'll open doors that have been shut and closed doors that the enemy has opened. He will do all these amazing things because he's a miracle working God. So let's just pray right now and we'll trust God to move in his power. Father, I thank you for the reality of angels. Father, I thank you you commissioned angelic beings to serve, to aid, to help the heirs of salvation. And Father, I thank you because of the blood of Jesus Christ and our acceptance in what Jesus Christ has done for us, that Lord, we are those heirs of salvation. So I pray the eyes of your people to be open to the supernatural realm, that you would start to see like you have never seen before in the precious name of Jesus. Father, just like the servant of Lord uh, Elijah, his eyes was open so he could see that it was more with him than against him. I pray the same for your people in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, that they would have encouragements that would come from angelic beings because Father God, they carry that Father heart message to your people. We give you glory and we honour you tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You do need prayer.